I would like to begin my presentation by explaining to you who I am, because what I'm going to talk to will uh, have some uh, connection with uh, my background. Well, first of all, I had the um, academic background, and I taught over 40 years uh, in various uh, universities, including International Christian University, where Professor Picken and I taught together for some time, and also University of Tokyo uh, and uh, Chuo University. And uh, also, I taught at uh, several uh, universities in the United States, like Columbia University, Mi University of Michigan, and also Australia, uh, University of, of Adelaide. Uh, I say this to you because um, I'm one of the um, uh, rare example of um, a Japanese scholars um, who have had uh, international, intercultural, and also interdisciplinary experiences, which year four, which you are participating now, year four, uh, uh, those are the principles year four is based on. And actually, what I'm going to tell you is exactly the importance, stress the importance of the principles therefore stand for. Um, in other words, I came out of academic circle. And academic circle, as you can see, is quite divided into different um, small drawers, if you want to say so. The international law, which I started as a, a first discipline that I wanted to major in, now, international law is a very narrow uh, area, and people only discuss on international law matters amongst themselves without paying much attention to the outside. And uh, also, I studied and taught at the beginning uh, at various Japanese universities. And Japanese universities focus on Japanese discussion in Japanese, uh, on international law. <clears throat> and uh, so international law discussion in Japan is narrow in Japan. And this is true, actually, of international law discussion in the United States, and also Australia, and also in Europe, where I also had some experience of uh, lecturing. Uh, but uh, over my experience uh, beyond the borders and the cultural restrictions, and uh, uh, also uh, disciplinary, the specialized field restrictions, uh, I could uh, tell you that from my own experience, this is the, the right approach for any person who is interested in pursuing some matters in an intellectual manner, in a scientific manner. One of the things that I had experience beyond academic experience is the actual legal work in an international institution, the World Bank, based in Washington. But this is a, not an American bank, but it is an international bank composed of over, at, at the time I was working, over 130 member states. Um, and I was working as a legal counsel. And as a legal counsel at the World Bank, I faced a number of interesting issues, like um, whether the World Bank could finance a project in South Af Africa, Republic of South Africa, in the 70s, when they were practicing um, discriminatory uh, pre uh, policy of apartheid, very uh, uh, awful human rights violation, uh, but the country is telling to the world that that is the principle based on uh, the Republic of um, uh, South Africa, and uh, we, we pursue this policy. Now, the World Bank, which is composed of 130 members, um, they 
represent uh, different civilizations, different cultures, different races, different re religions, and they cannot condone um, the policy adopted by uh, South Africa. And yet, the World Bank at that time was based on the principle that only economically justifiable projects that World Bank will finance. And only economic consideration is valid for deciding whether the World Bank finances or not. Now, if you apply this principle, even at the time in the 1970s, uh, South Africa was quite economically sound because it has rich resources. So, um, World Bank management proposed two uh, development projects in South Africa. But the South African government was applying apartheid policy against a great majority of Africans in South Africa. And uh, if you support the government, you are actually indirectly or even directly supporting the apartheid policy of South Africa. The World Bank should support that. World Bank is, by the way, a, a member of the United Nations family called Specialized Agency of the, World, of the United Nations. And United Nations at that time was applying uh, sanction against South Africa because of the apartheid policy. Now, how World Bank, which is the sister body of the United Nations, financed the government which applies apartheid? That was a big legal issue. And uh, uh, within the legal department, when I was working there, uh, this was a big discussion. We came to the conclusion that the World Bank should not finance. So I'm happy that uh, uh, the conclusion was uh, in support of the uh, justice that uh, many people wanted uh, to see. But in any case, that is the kind of experience I had at the World Bank, which normal academic people studying in the library and reading materials, newspapers, and discussing in the classrooms, they do not see this kind of problem. And only I had the opportunity to work in the World Bank, I was exposed to this kind of very important practical, but um, also very uh, significant case which affects the theory of international law, uh, which I will explain to you a little later. I was also a member of the UN Subcommission on Human Rights. This is composed of uh, 26 experts of in, uh, human rights. Uh, and this is the United Nations uh, body under the Commission on Human Rights. A Commission of Human Rights was composed of the representatives of the governments. When Madame Eleanor Roosevelt, you know, wife of uh, uh, Franklin Roosevelt, who died just before the end of the Second World War, just before the establishment of the UN, uh, Eleanor Roosevelt was included among the American delegation as a matter of courtesy to begin with by um, uh, President Truman, who succeeded Franklin Roosevelt, um, to represent her late husband in the first session of the General Assembly of the United Nations, which was held in 1946 in London. <clears throat> um, American delegation was composed of maybe uh, 50, 60 uh, people very distinguished people, some of them senators, some of them uh, uh, high-level uh, government officials and some politicians and so on. But according to the uh, uh, memoir of uh, Eleanor Roosevelt, all of them were men, and she was the only lady member of the American delegation at that time. And in the um, uh, ship that the American delegation was traveling from New York to London, uh, they met and discussed the division of labor among the main members. Who is going to take part in the uh, disarmament issue? Who is going to take uh, uh, part in the uh, uh, economic development assistance and so on? Now, all men were interested in political issues, uh, economic issues. The, the, the topic that uh, 
many people considered at that time as the hardcore international issues. But the United Nations, I will tell you a little later, was also um, aiming at the promotion and protection of human rights as one of the objectives. And when American delegation came to the topic of human rights, no one, all men, were interested in being a part of this issue because they didn't know much about it. And secondly, they did not consider human rights as an important topic. They looked around, and who could be a, mem a representative from uh, the United States delegation for human rights matters? And they saw Eleanor Roosevelt sitting behind. Maybe she can do it, uh, thinking that a lady at that time, American delegation, most of the people considered as uh, less important for international conference like the General Assembly uh, session. And also, human rights is an unimportant topic. So maybe this unimportant topic can be given to this less significant person within the delegation. But when the first session of the United Nations General Assembly started in London, this became the most important topic because they had to address the issue of huge uh, refugee problem in Europe. Over one million refugees were roaming around the western part of Europe at that time. And that area had been devastated and destroyed. But they were roaming in the, this destroyed land, looking for freedom. They fled from uh, the Soviet Union and also Eastern European area, which was getting influence from the Soviet Union at, at that time, at the end of the Second World War. So um, this huge uh, refugee issue was a, a problem in uh, uh, the first session of the United Nations General Assembly. And <clears throat> Mrs. Roosevelt was the person representing the American delegation at that time on this issue. And she discussed, actually debated, uh, against um, strong representatives from the Soviet Union particularly. Uh, and um, uh, she never gave in. She said, those refugees in Europe, they must be given the opportunity to make a choice of their own. They can go anywhere they want to. The Soviet delegation said, no, no, they have to go back to their homeland. Uh, that means to the Soviet Union and also Eastern European countries under the influence of the Soviet Union. Because the Soviet Union and the socialist countries at that time say, saying to the world that socialism is the future of the humankind and we are creating a beautiful dreamland under communism, socialism principles. But when refugees come out unhappy with what they will living, it would be contrary to what they are trying to explain to the people, the situation of the socialism in the Soviet Union and Eastern Europe. So this was a big uh, discussion uh, matter. And actually, uh, Mrs. Roosevelt finally won. And uh, the United Nations General Assembly adopted a resolution supporting the freedom of choice of where to settle for those uh, over one million refugees in Europe at that time. Now, Mrs. Rose, uh, Roosevelt was the one responsible for creating UN Subcommission on Human Rights and also Commission on Human Rights, uh, which is above this uh, organization. And um, so um, I followed the work of the, uh, uh, Mrs. Roosevelt uh, very closely. And uh, every time I learned something when I read uh, about her and also uh, writings by her, and uh, I was uh, very much impressed and I was proud to work in the committee, committee which was actually created by Mrs. Roosevelt. I was also special rapporteur appointed by the uh, 
commission in human rights, which is the uh, mother body above the subcommission uh, of the United Nations, um, as special rapporteur for Myanmar. That was in 1991. Uh, 1988 is the important uh, year for Myanmar history, because that was the year uh, the uh, military council held the whole power of the country to control and applied very suppressive policy against people, workers, and monks, and um, uh, ordinary people, including Doan San Suu Kyi, who was the leader of the democratic movement at that time. And uh, the United Nations uh, Commission on Human Rights was very much worried about the uh, situation in Myanmar and appointed me to uh, uh, study uh, the human rights situation there. And for five uh, succeeding years, I visited the country, negotiated with the government representatives, and reported to the General Assembly as well as the Commission on Human Rights uh, on the human rights situation uh, in that country, which was really, really bad. And my report was very critical of the situation. And so, uh, as a result, my name was under the blacklist of the Burmese uh, government at that time. And when I uh, resigned from the post of special rapporteurship and um, uh, decided to revisit the country after several years, uh, uh, Myanmar authorities declined to uh, give me a visiting visa even as a tourist uh, because of the uh, uh, nature of uh, cri cri critical nature of my uh, uh, report on that country's human rights situation. Uh, towards the end, uh, they accepted my uh, application for a visa, and I finally succeeded in visiting as a tourist with my wife at that time. But uh, uh, it took uh, some time for negotiation. Uh, until last year. I was um, a member of the ILO Committee of Experts. This is again a committee of uh, individual experts uh, to look into the uh, actual application of ILO conventions in each ratifying country. ILO has adopted uh, something like 190 uh, conventions uh, regarding the uh, uh, rights of the workers, like right to organize, right to strike, and right to uh, uh, collective bargain, as well as a working hours, uh, uh, minimum wages, uh, prohibition of uh, forced labor, prohibition of child labor, all those conventions. Uh, it is now uh, numbered as 191 or something like that. and but. Each member state of the ILO must ratify them before they can be applied within the country. Many countries <coughs> have ratified <coughs> ILO conventions because they want to be in line with other countries for uh, promoting the rights of uh, workers. <coughs> but when it comes to actual application, many countries try to avoid actual application. So the committee of experts <coughs> look into the application application uh, situation and uh, make comments and actually what we found out would be published in a booklet form as well as an, uh, in a database. I have been exposed to those <coughs> very interesting <coughs> academic, cultural, international, and uh, practical experiences as I have explained to you. But the main topic of my specialty, international law, actually does not deal with human rights up until, uh, say, um, uh, 1945, when the United Nations was created. <clears throat> the reason is very simple. Until 1945, when, until the United Nations was created, uh, international law was defined as law regulating the relationship among states. That means International law deals with the rights and duties of states, not individuals, not persons, human beings. So when you say human rights, 
at the rights of human beings. And so the matter is outside of international law. That was the traditional approach of international law until 1945. And human rights were already discussed, uh, but only within the <coughs> national context. It, uh, human rights were considered to be a matter of national concern, national jurisdiction. <coughs> that was the understanding up to 1945. Now, when the United Nations was created in 1945, things have changed. Traditional issue that international law dealt with was maintenance of peace, prohibition of war, and uh, economic cooperation and uh, economic advancement, but promotion and protection of human rights were not considered at all, but the United Nations in Article 1 clearly stated that promotion and protection of human rights would be one of the three objectives of the United Nations. Now, this is a big change, but as you can see, the change in the document called Charter of the United Nations doesn't change the mind of the people so quickly. And most international lawyers did not follow what the United Nations Charter said, and they stuck to traditional understanding of international law. And so international law circles, international law associations, societies in the world did not pay much attention to the importance of human rights as a subject of international law. They considered that, oh, this is still a matter to be dealt with in uh, domestic law, municipal law. The reason for the United Nations Charter to include promotion and protection of human rights uh, as um, uh, one of the three objectives of the United Nations is very real and clear. There were many, many human rights violations taking place during the war. And they were violated by states. And unless you regulate the behavior of states, terrible human rights violations cannot be prevented at all. If you take the example of Holocaust, it is very clear. And also the uh, Japanese militarism atrocities in Southeast Asia, in China, in Korea, that's another example. But Germany and Japan are not the only countries responsible for human rights violations during the Second World War. Many other governments also were responsible for serious human rights violations. And uh, so the drafters of the Charter of the United Nations uh, agreed that human rights protection must be included among the three objectives of the United Nations. That's one uh, reason. And the second reason is what I have said. Uh, after the Second World War, millions of refugees fled from the Soviet Union and Eastern Europe into Western Europe. And the United Nations had to deal with this kind of um, uh, refugee matters. And so uh, those are the main two reasons promotion and protection of human rights was included in the Charter of the United Nations as a objective. Now, the United Nations, since its establishment, it has the promotion and protection of human rights as one of the objectives. And the UN has done a lot of things after the creation over 70 years now, uh, exactly 70 years now. This year, UN is celebrating 70th anniversary of the creation. Uh, <clears throat> and the promotion and protection of human rights in the world has been carried on mainly by the activities of the United Nations. And without the United Nations, we could not have seen the kind of achievements that we see today in the field of human rights. And I can uh, summarize into three different areas of um, uh, human rights development that the United Nations was uh, 
contributing. Uh, one is institution building, and two is standard setting, and three, supervision of compliance. There has to be some kind of institution in order to promote and protect human rights. That's one. But also, you have to have some kind of standards when you talk about human rights. We know freedom of speech, freedom of religion, and uh, political participation, and the workers' rights, and uh, non-discrimination against women and minorities. Those we know very well, but they have to be somehow clearly stated so that international society can refer to when they talk about human rights violations. When I was special reporter for Myanmar, the Burmese authorities asked me, Mr. Yokota, you, you say we are violating human rights, but where you can find the human rights standards that you are talking about? And uh, I said, many countries have constitutional law provisions for human rights. Japan is one, US is one, um, France is one. Uh, and uh, the military representative said, sorry, we don't have the constitution now. Uh, and that is true. <clears throat> then they asked me, then what do we rely on? I told them that the United Nations has been involved in standard setting, not only institution, but standard setting. And now UN has produced many, many human rights documents, which you can call as international human rights standards now. And uh, one of the most important one, I will tell you later, is the uh, Universal Declaration of Human Rights adopted in 1948 by the General Assembly of the United Nations. Uh, actually, the discussion was very interesting. The uh, Burmese authorities said, well, Mr. Yokota, uh, that was just a uh, document adopted by the General Assembly. And General Assembly is not the world legislature. No one is bound by the uh, resolution of the United Nations General Assembly. And legally speaking, that argument is quite strong. But uh, at that time, I explained to the Burmese authorities, yes, that is true in a strict legal sense of the term, but also members can pledge, express, to be bound by the standards adopted by the General Assembly, like the um, uh, Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And those countries which voted for the adoption of the Universal Declaration, actually they are expressing their support and their, their pledge to be bound by this document. So each country which voted for the adoption of the Universal Declaration must be bound by this document. And by the way, I told them, and I knew it before uh, I told them, that <clears throat> Burma at that time, the Burma starts with B, and if you go by alphabetical order at that time in the General Assembly meeting, Burma was the first country in the al alphabetical order at that time. Burma was the first country which voted yes to the adoption of the Universal Declaration. You're the first country, and you're praised for that by all countries. Are you saying that you are not bound by the Universal Declaration, that you support it? That was the argument I presented, and the, fortunately, the Burmese authorities did not pursue that topic anymore, and they agreed that the Universal Declaration of Human Rights could be uh, the basis for judging whether Burma was uh, violating human rights or not at that time. And unfortunately, many, many human rights violations were taking place at that time. And also, supervision of compliance is extremely important. And uh, I was special reporter for Myanmar, appointed by the uh, Commission on Human Rights. That was exactly the procedure UN has adopted to pursue the compliance by member states of the human rights standards. Um, this is just one example, actually. Uh, 
when I was appointed in 1991, uh, that procedure was one or two exceptional procedures. But today, we have much wider uh, procedure for making the government comply with the international human rights standards. And I, I'm going to explain to you instantly. Uh, first, let me talk about institution building before we get to uh, uh, the standard setting and uh, supervision. Up until 19, uh, from 1946 or 47, around that time, up to 2006, uh, about nine years ago, Commission on Human Rights and the Subcommission on Human Rights were the two pillars of the UN institution dealing with human rights, focusing on human rights. They met every year to discuss only the human rights matters. Uh, in the case of uh, Commission on Human Rights, they met three, month, uh, three weeks uh, every March. And in the case of the Commission on the Promotion and Protection of Human Rights, this is too long, so we normally shorten it to uh, uh, be called the Subcommission on Human Rights. Uh, that met in August for four weeks. That was the structure uh, which was working up to 2006. But in 2006, a uh, big uh, institution uh, change took place. And actually, this is an improvement, actually. And that is the creation of Human Rights Council and the, its advisory committee. Those two institutions replaced uh, the Commission on Human Rights and the Subcommission on Human Rights. Uh, Human Rights Council is composed of 47 uh, members of the United Nations, elected by the General Assembly. And the advisory committee is composed of 18 experts, individual specialists. Now, institution, uh, uh, the standard setting, the most important one that UN has adopted for the first time actually in the world, that was the Universal Declaration of Human Rights in 1948. And after that, the United Nations has adopted a big number of important human rights conventions. And this time, it's not just a uh, General Assembly re uh, resolution, but they are legally binding convention, treaties. And uh, all governments are encouraged to ratify. And in fact, many, many governments have ratified those uh, human rights uh, conventions. First, genocide convention to prohibit the kind of mass killing done by the uh, Nazi Germany during the Second World War, and the uh, Refugee Convention and Protocol to deal with the uh, huge number of refugees, Racial Discrimination Convention, prohibiting racial discrimination, and International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, uh, that is basically the uh, political rights like participation in the voting, at, uh, the uh, uh, parliamentary elections and also standing for uh, the membership of the parliament and so on. Uh, also freedom of speech, freedom of association, those are included in the uh, civil and political rights covenant. And also international covenant on economic, social and cultural rights that would deal with the rights of the workers, uh, social welfare, uh, health, right to education, those are called economic, social, and cultural rights. Famous and important uh, convention for the elimination of uh, discrimination against women, and convention against torture, convention on the rights of the child, convention on forced disappearance. Uh, also, the most recent one uh, is uh, convention on the rights of persons with disabilities. I cannot um, uh, go into details, but you can understand roughly what those conventions are trying to achieve. Each category of persons or category of human rights that they are trying to focus and promote. And the interesting thing is, each convention 
uh, except universal declaration, genocide, and refugee. Other than that, all conventions and uh, covenant, starting from racial discrimination and uh, political, uh, civil and political rights and so on, all of them have international committees for each treaty, each convention, uh, composed of uh, either 18 experts or sometimes 10 experts, depending on the, the uh, convention. And they look into the human rights situation of the countries which have ratified those conventions. And this is the uh, supervision procedure that I'm going to explain to you now. The supervision is uh, developing now. Uh, first of all, universal periodic review done by the Human Rights Council of the United Nations. This is done for all members of the United Nations, no exception, all countries, including China, North Korea, Iraq, Japan, US, UK, all of them, but not every year, every four and a half years. Uh, regularly, and that is why it is called periodic. And it is universal because it applies to all countries, all countries in the world. And uh, this is done very meticulously, asking the government to first make their own report, and then ask non-governmental organizations and other interested people to make comments on the government report. And the, uh, the uh, Human Rights uh, uh, Council members would look into both the government report and um, uh, comments from the NGOs and make a fair judgment on the final conclusions. State report review mechanism is similar, but this is done in each human rights convention and covenant. For example, uh, Convention on the Rights of the Child has one committee, as I said, and the committee asked the government, which have ratified the uh, convention, to make a report every five years. And again, this report will be published and <coughs> uh, NGOs are requested to make comments on, and uh, the committee looks into the uh, actual situation, ask, asking the government to send representatives to the meeting, and there is a kind of cross-examination by the members of the committee and the government representing uh, that particular state. Uh, individual communications procedure or complaint procedure, this is interesting. This applies only to those countries which have uh, ac accepted this procedure. Japan has not accepted yet. US has not accepted yet. But many countries in Europe and even in Asia have uh, adopted this uh, procedure. When you adopt this procedure, <clears throat> whoever is staying in that country and feel that their human rights are violated against the provisions of the conventions that country has ratified, they can communicate to the committee and the committee looks into the situation and makes recommendations to the government. Change this, or improve this, or stop this. Uh, this is not legally binding, but still it has an international authority because it is done by internationally known experts who are members of the uh, committee. So this is a, a very powerful uh, uh, power powerful procedure to influence the government to change their attitudes towards the application of the conventions. As I said, I was a member of the <coughs> uh, ILO Committee of Experts, and um, uh, ILO has a supervisory mechanism as well. In the case of ILO, uh, ILO has adopted uh, about 190 ILO conventions, and many governments have ratified uh, many of them, and ILO Committee of Experts looks into the actual uh, situation of those conventions in each country. 
um, uh, it, it is not done every year, but every five years for ordinary convention. But important conventions like the Convention on the Rights of the Child of, or uh, uh, Non-Discrimination Against Women or uh, Right to Organize, Right to Collective Bargaining, those important conventions every three years. And um, uh, after studying the government reports and also comments from the workers' organizations, trade unions, and also um, uh, employers' organizations, uh, the Committee of Experts makes a uh, independent and uh, non-political judgment on the situation. And this is published. Uh, I will quickly go into the problems the UN system is in the field of human rights is facing. One is, as you can see, so many human rights conventions. It's a proliferation of human rights mechanisms. And today, no government and no person, no specialist can follow closely what is happening in each uh, procedures and so on. This is a problem, and we have to somehow streamline. This is one problem. Secondly, when we make comments on the human rights situation in one country, the country always feels they are picked up for political reasons and uh, uh, the standards are applied selectively. Uh, and uh, so how we can uh, balance the, um, uh, the judgment more neutral, more uh, non-political, and, and, and this is uh, always a problem. And I face this problem as a member of the ILO Committee of Experts as well as a member of the UN Subcommission on Human Rights. And uh, even if we have these conventions and um, uh, me uh, supervision mechanism, the uh, many governments do violate human rights. And how you do it? Uh, in, the, in, in, in a country, human rights are violated, it will be somehow enforced. Violators will be punished, brought to justice. But in the international uh, scene, this is not done particularly by force, because if you apply by force to uh, make sure uh, human rights um, uh, are protected, it, you might face with um, even a, another war, another uh, armed conflict. So in order to avoid armed conflict and war, and yet if you have to make governments to comply with international human rights standards. This is a very difficult and tricky uh, matter, and we are facing this problem. And lastly, uh, I started off as an international lawyer, and I still face this problem of a gap between international lawyers' understanding of international human rights law and many domestic lawyers' understanding of international human rights law. i just tell you one example. ILO has adopted many ILO conventions. And in the case of Japan, Japan has uh, 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 ratified many of them. And yet, labor law scholars, labor law professors, do not talk about ILO at all. I checked about 20 textbooks used in a labor law courses in Japan, Japanese law schools. And out of 20, only five referred to ILO. Others had no mention of ILO. So there's a big gap between labor law specialist understanding of what is happening in the international scene. At the same time, the persons working in an international scene to apply international human rights standards, uh, we sometimes do not follow what is discussed within the uh, municipal law, within the uh, uh, legal circles in each country. And there's still a gap between the two, and this has to be overcome. Cultural diversity is one. I don't have to explain to you so uh, uh, fully on this topic, because EFO is trying to uh, uh, overcome this. Cultural diversity is fine. There's no problem with that. The question is, this has to be uh, this, this has to be understood that cultural diversity is not a source of conflict, 
but rather it gives opportunities for further advancement of humanity. And uh, we, we have to uh, try to uh, uh, promote a culture of diversity. But unfortunately, in the case of human rights, many governments say we have our own international human rights standards reflecting our own cultural uh, tradition. So this is a, a problem we are now facing. UN, as I said, is celebrating the 70th anniversary uh, this year. And this is uh, an important uh, opportunity for UN and for us all to appreciate, first of all, what the UN has achieved, which is quite impressive. But at the same time, it has many problems. And we have to tackle those problems in order to make the world much more humane, much more um, uh, comfortable for everyone without any distinction, everyone to live uh, healthy and uh, profitable and meaningful life. Uh, we can do it with today's uh, technological scientific advancement, but somehow our social institutions and even legal institutions do not catch up with this technological scientific advancement to apply the, the fruit of uh, our human achievements to everyone in the world. And this is what we have to do. UN is the only uh, institution which can do this worldwide. And I think we have to uh, promote uh, further the activities of the United Nations in the field of human rights. Thank you for your kind attention. <laughs>